Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Education USA Friday webinar series. Uh, I can see that quite a few, few participants from all over India have logged in for the webinar. It would be great uh, if you could just type into the chat box and let us know from which city are you logging in. Also, just to let you know, for today's webinar, we are going to talk about the pre-departure. That is uh, how to plan your departure, and um, it's like a pre-departure orientation session today. And today's presenter presenters are um, Aaron Brady and Lisa from North Dakota State University. And along with that, Tanushka Bali, who is an Education USA advisor, will also talk about a few very important tips for your departure. Before I hand over to Tanushka to um, start with her portion of the program, I would like to inform you a bit about Education USA. So Education USA is a network of approximately 400 centers across 170 countries. Our mission is to give all students accurate, current, and comprehensive information in the most unbiased way possible. And we are here to help all of you with the US university application process. We are here to decode the process for you since it can get confusing because of so much information that is um, there. And so continuing with that, uh, Education USA has come up with a five step process to apply to US universities. The last step, that is the fifth step, is to prepare for departure. And I'm assuming that all of you have already completed this journey and are already on the last step. And so today our, uh, our presenters will be talking about this very important step of preparing for your departure and when, which is going to really help you settle in in the US easily. So um, without wasting much time, I would like to hand over to Tanushka. Um, so Tanushka, I'm putting you online now. Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me? If you all can hear me, please type into the chat box and let me know that you can hear me. Aditi, am I audible? Great. OK, let's get started. Good evening, everyone. Anushka, can name you hear is, me? Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Please go ahead. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's session. As Aditi just introduced me, I'm Tanushka, and I work out of the USIEF Mumbai office. And uh, today we'll be discussing a few important tips that you would, that you should know before you leave for the US. So, <clears throat> before I just have a few slides that I'll be sharing with you, and I'll be taking about five or ten minutes of your time. And then I'll hand the presentation over to Erin from North Dakota State University. So just a couple of tips before we get started. The first thing that students need to be aware of when they're considering flying to the US, you know, you've gotten your visa, you've, you've already been admitted, you've got your I-20, you've got your documents in place, you've arranged your finances, you've got your visa, and now you're actually planning for your departure. So a couple of important things that you should know and that we, we, I'm going to be sharing that with you over the next few slides. Before you leave, the first thing that you need to be, you need to consider are your flights and your luggage. The first thing is to check your airline policy on luggage, especially for domestic air travel in the US. Now, these flights to the US are extremely long and sometimes you don't have direct flights. So you may end up taking two or three flights to get to your destination within the US. And you may end up having layovers in a country, you know, like the UK or Germany or wherever before you actually reach the US. So oftentimes what happens is you'll be booked on an international flight to a main city or a main port in the US, and then you'll have to switch to a domestic flight to get to your city, wherever it is within the US, from your main port of entry. 
so oftentimes oftentimes you you know you may find that your international flight will take you to a main city such as san francisco or new york or washington dc and from there you have to take a domestic flight to get to the other city which is you know where your final destination is right so the thing to be aware of over here is international flights have different baggage allowances than domestic flights so this is something when you are booking your flights if you're going to a travel agent or if you're going directly with the airline please check with them and confirm that you have you know the complete baggage allowance all the way up to your final destination because otherwise you may have to pay an additional amount um, for your final leg of the journey right so this is something that you need to be aware of now you may come across many flights many airlines offering student deals where you are given additional baggage allowance so you may be allowed up to three bags uh, for the us and each bag is about 50 pounds each or 70 pounds each and it depends on the airline uh, that's great if you get that offer my advice to you is that this additional baggage allowance is really not necessary students really think that they need to take everything that they own with them and that they need as much baggage allowance as possible. We strongly encourage you to be very careful with your packing and take just what's necessary. And just because you have the additional baggage allowance, it doesn't mean you have to take three bags with you to the US. Another important tip is that your important documents such as your passport and your I-20 should be in your hand luggage at all times. And, and the main reason is that when you land in the US, you have to present your passport and you have to present your I-20 to border security and immigration, right? Now, if this is in your check-in baggage, you won't be able to access it. So you have to cross immigration first before you can go pick up your bags. So these important documents should be with you at all times. The next thing to do is to arrange your transportation to the university in advance. Now, this would require you either connecting with the international student office or at some universities, students connect with the Indian uh, club or the Indian student organization and set up some sort of transportation for themselves. Most universities will arrange to pick you up, but if your university doesn't do that, then you can definitely, as I mentioned, get in touch with the Indian Student Association or get in touch with anybody you know to help to help you get to your university from the airport. Now, if no one's picking you up, then it's a good idea to visit the airport's um, website. All US uh, airports have a website where they give you information about the various ground transportation options that are available out of that airport. So just make sure you've visited the website beforehand that you know, you know what's available. Some airports will have trains connecting to the city or you may have shuttle buses or taxis or different uh, forms of ground transportation. So it's a good idea to know what's available and it's a good idea to know how much a trip to your university will cost you approximately and keep that much money aside for that journey. Also, always ensure that you have contact information in case of an emergency, somebody that you can reach out to. Now, if you don't know anybody in the city or you don't have any friends or relatives or you know, you're, nobody's coming to pick you up, make sure and you're landing in the US on a weekend, such as a, sat or like a Saturday or a Sunday, make sure you connect with the international student office beforehand and get somebody's contact information uh, someone that you can call on a Saturday or a Sunday, even though they won't be in the office, somebody's personal number that you could call in case of an emergency, in case you get lost or you get stuck, or you, have, you need any help of any sort. Now, coming back to your, fly, to your flight from India to the US, as I mentioned before, that your journey may be broken up and you may have a layover. Now, ensure that you have an you have enough time for these layovers because sometimes you need to change the plane, you need to change the terminal, and you need to change, uh, you may even need to change which airport you are at. Um, 
you know on route so make sure there's enough time don't leave just an hour or an hour and a half between flights make sure you get at least three to four four hours at the minimum so that just in case your incoming flight is delayed or your you know there's an issue with the bags or there's issue with security or there's just the lines are really really long you have enough time to navigate your you know your way to your next flight so the important uh, tip that we've highlighted on the, the bottom of the slide is that don't be tempted to carry everything you own. The lighter you travel, the better it is for you. We hear this from our students all the time, that they ended up not using a lot of the things that they took away. So before you leave, I just want to talk a little bit about what to carry and what not to carry. So, You'll find that most students at US universities will primarily wear jeans and t-shirts and you'll find yourself doing the same. Uh, so it's, you know, your attire is casual. You're not, you're not required to wear formal clothes like you are at some colleges and universities in India. There's no, you know, no formal dress code as such. And most students will, you know, be very comfortable in their jeans or shorts and t-shirts. So this is what you should be packing. This is what you should uh, have as the bulk of your uh, packing. Please make sure that you carry a couple of pairs of good, strong walking slash athletic shoes because you'll be doing a lot of walking. US university campuses tend to be very large and very, very spread out. And a lot of towns in the US are towns that encourage walking around as well, right? You may want to carry one or two of your Indian clothes just for special occasions such as Diwali or your Indian student night or a cultural night that you may have at uh, the university. This is the most important tip. The next one is please carry one really warm jacket, sweater or sweatshirt for the flight and for when you land. When you land in the US, it's usually mid to late August, early September, and that's when it's just starting to get a little bit cold. Now, the cold in the US is very, very different from cold you may have experienced in India, and it can be a huge temperature difference. So just make sure you have something really warm that can tide you over for the first few days or the first week till you go and buy uh, more warm clothes. So as I've already mentioned, you must carry all your important documents in your hand baggage, and that should be with you at all time. Don't ever leave your hand baggage unattended or in, you know, with someone that you don't know or someone that you may have just recently met during your flight. Just keep it with you at all times. Many Indian students, you know, many of you may want to cook in the US. So if you want to carry utensils the only thing we'd recommend is maybe a small saucepan and a medium small or a medium sized pressure cooker honestly you get everything in the us so you really don't need to carry everything from here make sure that you carry enough snacks for your journey it will take you at least 24 to 36 hours to get to your destination depending on which indian city you're leaving from and which american city you're going to so food that you can carry with you are fruit, sandwiches, peanuts, or almonds, or just something that you can snack on if you're hungry and you're waiting. Um, you know, when you're waiting for your next flight or you're at a layover. Um, so just carry some munchies with you. It's also a good idea to carry a refillable water bottle, which will help you stay hydrated throughout your journey. You know, if you've been on flights, you know that when you ask for water, you usually just get a cup or a small 100, 200 ml bottle. So it's just better to carry your own water bottle and you can refill it on the go. Um, you may want to consider carrying a, a few, not too many, uh, ready to cook or microwavable packaged meals to just tide you over the first few days when you get there. This is not necessary, but if you're thinking of taking food, this is what I would recommend. So um, getting prescription glasses in the US can be extremely expensive. So I would recommend that if you wear glasses, carry an extra pair or maybe even two extra pairs from India itself. Make sure you have your basic medicines with you for fever, headache, nausea, cold, um, acidity, or any other sort of common ailment that you may have. Now, if you have any medication 
that you're taking regularly that's been prescribed by your doctor and you need to carry that in bulk, you can do so, but make sure you carry your prescription with you, okay? Um, in your hand luggage, I would also recommend keeping some basic toiletries and a quick dry towel. Again, this is not necessary, but you know, this is, you can carry it or a small hand towel just because the journeys are so long and you may want to freshen up along the way, right? It's also important to keep one change of clothes in your hand luggage because sometimes, you know, bags can get misplaced or bags can get lost. So just make sure you have something to change into just in case that happens. The last point, and you may laugh at me and you may laugh at this point, but you must carry a pen because you'll be filling immigration and customs forms when you land in the US. So just keep a pen with you. Um, because usually other passengers also don't have this as well. So you, you know, just be better prepared and just carry a couple of pens with you in your hand baggage. So we also have some advice on what not to take. Many students think that they need to wear formal clothes every single day and that's not required at all. You may carry a couple of, uh, you know, couple of outfits for formal wear just for formal occasions but like I said previously you'll be in jeans and t-shirts most of the time. Students are also very tempted to carry their bulky textbooks. Everything will be available at your university, um, at your university bookstore and your university library so that's something that we don't really recommend that you carry from India. Food items such as rice, dals, meats and spices are also something that I wouldn't recommend you carry. And if you want to know what, what's allowed and what's not allowed uh, into the US, you can visit the Customs and Border Protection website. It's cbp.gov and you'll get more information on what you're allowed to carry into the US and what's not allowed. Also, you don't need to carry stationary notebooks, files, folders. These are available very easily and at very, very cheap prices uh, in the US. It's also not really recommended to carry your winter clothing from India because the, as I mentioned previously, um, the winters in the US are very, very different from winters in India. And it can be quite cold for somebody who's going there or experiencing it for the first time. So if you're going to a cold place, then, you know, like I said, carry something warm for the first few days or for the first week, and then go to the US and then buy your winter wear from there, okay? The next thing that you should not be carrying is any illegal substances, um, any hard drives or pen drives or any storage devices with illegal downloads of any kind. This can be an issue and we have heard of students getting into trouble because of this. So please don't carry any of this with you. And again, you may be tempted or your parents may be tempted to send you with household items that you may need. These are all very easily available and very uh, and they're available at very cheap prices in the US. So you don't need to carry things like laundry detergent, shampoo, bed, uh, bed linen, towels, you know, cooking vessels and things like that. Again, don't be tempted to carry everything you own. The lighter you travel, the better it is. So now I'm just going to come to the last slide. And these are things that we recommend you do before you leave. Make sure you get an eye and dental checkup done in India because sometimes uh, dental, dental care is not included in your insurance. So you'll have to, and dental care can be very expensive in the US, so make sure you get that done over here. Um, you know, get your hair cut, get your salon services also done in India because you may find uh, that you'll be, a, it's, it can be expensive in the US, and B, you may, you'll be really busy uh, with your studies, so you may not find, to do, find time to do that, right? Um, enjoy this time, you know, spend time with your friends and family, eat your favorite foods, um, you know, make sure you, you make the most of this the last few weeks that you have in India. So also buy foreign exchange for your journey and for when you first land. We recommend that you carry around 300 to $500 with you. You can carry more if you'd like. And um, it's, you know, don't carry too much of cash. You can carry an international credit card, a debit card, or maybe even a prepaid Visa or MasterCard for emergencies. When you buy foreign exchange, make sure you have a few smaller bills, such as, you know, uh, 
one five and ten dollar bills you'll need this for cheap you know if you want to buy a cup of coffee at the airport or uh you know if you want to have like a snack or a meal or you want to buy something if you've got a hundred dollar bill you may not you know it, it makes it a little bit tougher for the cashier to give you change so just carry a little bit of change especially if you're you know if you're feeding money into a machine from which you're dispensing a snack or you're dispensing a, a drink or something then that won't accept big bills right so again um so that's the end of what i wanted to share and these are all things that you know this is all advice for before you leave and my last advice if you take anything away from this is again don't be tempted to carry everything you own the lighter you travel the better it is so now i'm going to hand the presentation over to erin and she's going to talk a little bit more about you know classroom culture and what uh, attending a us university is actually like for students so thank you uh, and over to you erin Good morning, uh, my name is Erin Brady and I'm the Assistant Director for International Recruitment here in the Office of Admission. And the Office of Admission assists students who are applying to our Intensive English Language Program or to um, a Bachelor's Degree Program. Hello, I'm Lisa Houck. I'm here with Erin Brady today and I work in the Graduate School as a Recruitment and International Activities Coordinator. And just before we um, dive into our presentation here, we just wanted to let you know that um, we may be going back and forth to the computer or to our phones. We have a couple students that um, are coming directly to NDSU this fall and they're having some difficulty logging in. So um, and just in case you see either of us not um, completely attentive, just, just note that we're trying to assist you and other students in joining our webinar this morning. So to get started, we just wanted to give an overview first of the different student visa types inside the United States. There are multiple, um, about a dozen or more uh, different visa types in the U.S. Um, for different purposes and um, under different categories. But the three categories that um, individuals can study on inside the United States for a period of time um, are F visas, um, which are for academic or English study, typically for a degree-seeking program. Um, at the high school um, level for associate's degrees, which are typically two-year programs in the U.S. for bachelor's degrees, typically four-year programs, um, master's degrees, two- or three-year programs, and then doctoral programs, which are often um, between three and five years, depending on the discipline. Um, there's J visas. Um, J visas are an exchange um, program category typically for individuals that come from sponsoring organizations, um, international organizations from sponsoring government um, funding, whether it's U.S. Um, specifically, if they come for an internship or to do research. Um, individuals can also come on um, student visas for um, non-study uh, purposes. And then finally, the M student visa category is often for vocational study. And most individuals in the U.S. that would be on M visas are those that um, are in vocational programs such as a flight or um, airline training program um, at an institution. Um, here at North Dakota State University, um, the students that Lisa and I work with, um, the majority of them are F students. So F1 would be their principal status. And that would likely be what you um, will be coming on this fall or um, uh, next spring. Now, going into the documents that you would need to prepare for um, an F or J or M student visa, most of the information that we're talking about today will be for students on F and J status, um, as M students um, are, do not study at NDSU because we do not have those vocational programs. Um, documents to prepare prior to your arrival, as Tanushka already talked about, you've completed the majority of the steps from Education USA as far as preparing to study inside the United States. Um, so you've already been um, accepted to an institution here at, uh, at NDSU or another one in the U.S. 
Prepare for your arrival to the U.S. Um, along the important documents that Tanushka mentioned, this would include your passport with your approved visa stamp um, or sticker page, your original CVIS Form I-20, which is your certificate of eligibility if you applied for an F-1 visa or you will apply um, in the next few weeks. If you have a DS-2019, which is a two-page certificate of eligibility, then you are applying for a J-1 visa. Um, and again, this would be typically for a short-term study program or for um, research later on. It's also important to bring um, your original um, or copy of your signed admission letter, your decision letter to the graduate school or department at the institution or to the office of admission typically um, are the ones who issue that, which says congratulations, you've been accepted, it has your start term. This is also helpful when you're preparing for your visa interview if you have yet to go because it sometimes has specific information about your academic program or it will um, direct you to your academic advisor. And those are helpful resources when you are researching um, and preparing for your visa interview to be able to discuss um, briefly only, but to still be able to discuss why you chose that specific academic program. Um, inside the United States and that specific institution rather than another one, um, it, uh, strengthens the, um, it strengthens your visa interview process. I would also recommend bringing financial statements, official or otherwise, with you. Um, these may be the ones you brought to your visa interview or a duplicate set that you may have um, obtained prior to sending any um, if required to your U.S. institution as part of the admission or I-20 issuance process. Um, often you're not asked for these, but in the case that there's a long line of customs when you enter the United States or um, the, uh, the Border Control Officer has some additional questions for you and asks um, for a separate meeting with you, the financials can help support the information that's in your documents and just show that you're overall prepared um, and that you've, um, you've thought about it very deeply about studying inside the United States and um, why you're coming here. Um, next steps when you arrive inside the United States um, after you enter, you're eligible to do so 30 days before the program start date on your I-20 um, or your DS-2019. So this would be on page one of either of those documents. Um, there should be a start date and an end date. Um, that start date is, means the program uh, date by which you should arrive at your institution um, as the, at the latest. Um, sometimes for graduate students, um, departments or advisors may permit you to enter after that date. If, for example, you're doing research for them before you start your program, for example, and then I would just recommend being in contact with them and, um, if possible, asking them for just a sign letter that explains that they're okay and or the institution, the university, is approving you to enter after the program start date and that it will not impact your ability to enroll as a full-time student to maintain your immigration status. But no, no earlier than 30 days before your program start date listed on that document. And then, of course, it's important to report to the institution listed on your, um, listed on your I-20 or your DS-2019. Um, Often for students, that's for orientation. If you arrive significantly before orientation, such as that 30 days beforehand or two weeks beforehand, when the orientation um, has not yet begun or will not begin for a couple of weeks, it's important to report to the international office at your institution to provide copies of your immigration documents um, and just to confirm that you arrived successfully and safely with all the necessary documents so they can activate your immigration record to avoid any issues um, moving forward. While you're inside the United States, I've talked a little bit about the importance of your immigration status. Um, maintaining that um, is also very important. Most institutions inside the U.S., including um, here at North Dakota State University, our orientation sessions, um, we do have a separate section or presentations on maintaining your immigration status, and our international student advisors um, present that session. And it's their job to assist you um, and be a resource for you throughout your stay here um, at NDSU or another institution with cultural changes, with um, 
uh, employment authorization, questions about your course load for registration, but most importantly, maintain your immigration status. They will assist you with reminding um, about how many credits you need to stay enrolled in, um, when you need to update your documents before you travel, for example. So your um, communication and your relationship with the international office at your institution is really important. Um, you may not need to visit them in person, but it's important to understand the resources that they provide you via email or on their website. Um, and as you are also responsible for um, helping to maintain transparency while you're here for academic study. The designated school official at your institution, or the DSO, is often an international student advisor, but it may also be a um, exchange student support coordinator or other individual inside the international office with a different title. But it's typically the individual who issued your I-20 and their name and signature um, is at the bottom of that document or on your DS-2019. Um, it's also important to know the expiration date of your visa, whether it's F1 or J1 or even M1. That expiration date of the visa would also be listed on that sticker or stamp page in your passport. Um, it's important to realize, though, that even if your visa um, shall expire, if you're inside the United States, that's, that's not a problem as long as your immigration document, so I-20 or DS-2019 is valid, um, your visa can expire while you're inside the United States. However, it's important to know that end date. If you anticipate traveling outside of the U.S., whether it's back to India or to another country for travel or um, over vacation months or weeks, um, you need to have a valid um, visa that matches with your appropriate um, immigration category, so an F visa, a J visa, or an M visa for re-entry and setting into the United States. Okay, um, this is Lisa and I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, uh, coming to NDSU specifically. I'm going to be um, talking about what is required here at our university but it's, it's very common, uh, I think, across uh, other universities and colleges. So for graduate students here, for graduate international students, and Erin will talk in a minute about some specifics for undergrad students. First of all, once you have accept, once you've been notified, and you'll be notified by email um, of your acceptance, you'll receive your, your acceptance letter and or um, teaching assistantship offer, together by email, we ask that you either accept or decline the offer of admission. And you can do that electronically. So you just go in and, and um, say, yes, I'm coming, or thank you very much, um, but I'm going to go somewhere else. After that, you should contact, and if you've accepted the offer of admission, which we hope you have, contact the International Student Services Office. And this is where the international student advisors work. They are the ones that will process um, your I-20 or your DS-2019, so the, the immigration document that you need in order to schedule your visa appointment. So, and there are instructions, detailed instructions about this on the website, but um, you would need to do that. And then um, they will create the, um, the I-20 or DS-2019 for you, and they'll send that to you by mail. Typically, um, you can get the number uh, before you receive it in by mail. You could get a scanned copy, and that way, go ahead and schedule your visa appointment earlier so that you don't have to wait for the actual hard copy to arrive. So while you're doing that, we also recommend that you reach out and contact your academic department or your academic advisor, um, usually at the graduate level, you will know um, who your advisor is going to be for your master's or for your, your PhD program. And um, they probably will reach out to you as well. But it's good to know for graduate students if there are additional expectations that your department has. They may have information that they want you to read um, or think about before you come. And then the other thing um, is to start, I, I've, I've included find housing, but really start looking for housing. As a graduate student, you have the option to, um, to live either on campus or off campus. On campus housing is 
Um, there's often a wait at the graduate level. So if you're interested, you should apply um, for on-campus housing well ahead of uh, your arrival. You can also um, ask around. We've got a number of international student organizations, including one for students from India. And you can contact them and um, just, just find a, a place to live or get suggestions through word of mouth. And then for graduate students as well, after you get here, there are two separate orientations for you. One of them is the international student orientation. So you're wearing a, a few different hats while you're here. One of them is um, that you are an international student. And as such, there are lots of, um, I think, important uh, bits of information and, and, and things that you need to know. That, um, that are in addition to students that are just from the US. So that is um, the Thursday and Friday, I think, usually prior to the start of classes. And then on the Monday, so at, at NDSU, classes start on a Monday, but not until officially until the evening. So that first entire um, Monday of the semester is a graduate student orientation. And in that, you are. You are a student from India, but you are, are most importantly a grad student. And so it's an orientation where you meet all of the other new graduate students and all of the information presented is specific for you as a grad student. And then if you happen to be a teaching assistant, you may have been offered an assistantship that involves teaching um, a lab or one of the lower level classes. We also have special training for you through the graduate school, and then probably your department will provide training as well. So those are some things that you will, um, you will be involved in before um, and then right after you arrive. And then for the undergraduate or intensive English language side, um, you get this to be for bachelor's degree programs. Um, the Office of Admission will send you your decision letter, um, so your acceptance letter, your uh, I-20, um, or DS 2019 from another office. Um, you will also receive information about next steps to complete, which include applying for on-campus housing. Uh, on-campus housing is guaranteed but also required for first-year students. And this is if you um, just completed your um, grade 10, your grade 12, or your class 12 examinations, or if you have not yet started um, any college university classes at all. Um, at the post-secondary level. Um, there's both residence halls um, and on-campus apartments available. Um, the apartments are typically um, what transfer students would um, find placement in on-campus. Um, and transfer students are those that have completed one or more courses um, at a post-secondary college or university, again, after completing your higher secondary school exams, your grade 12 exams. Um, transfer students are eligible to live off campus, and there's many options, as Lisa mentioned, um, near campus and in the community. And our Indian, um, our Association of Students from India um, organization can assist you with that, um, as well as there's um, some resources um, on the international office website um, as you prepare for orientation. They provide some resources and um, some search engines used inside the United States to locate housing in specific cities. In addition to um, applying for housing, another next step um, that we provided to you in print format in your admission packet um, would be to apply for um, additional international student scholarships and potentially departmental scholarships um, at the undergraduate level. So the departmental scholarships are different um, at, for undergraduates than they are for the graduate students that Lisa had talked about. Um, these are offered in the form of um, one-time uh, monetary awards um, that are very competitive um, and require um, higher uh, grade point averages. And there's other ones that are renewable awards, um, but only in specific academic departments. So for example, if your, um, if your academic program is computer science, for example, you can contact the computer science department and any scholarships that they have available for students that are newly enrolled um, will be listed on their website. But most of those scholarships um, are available after you have been here a minimum of one semester so that they can assess your success in those, um, in those classes for your program. Um, 
It's also important to review your program curriculum and your transfer credit evaluation report issued by NDSU to prepare for your registration. Now, if you haven't taken any classes at a college or university, you won't have one of these reports, but it essentially would say uh, the classes you've taken um, at another institution and that what they transfer to at NDSU towards credits for uh, your NDSU graduation. Um, it's about four to six weeks for processing of that. Um, if you are a first year student or you have not taken any post-secondary classes, um, all undergraduate international students register for classes in person during the international student orientation. Um, as part of that, um, classes again here at NDSU, as Lisa mentioned, start in the evening on the Monday of the first day of classes. And that morning, graduate students will have a separate orientation. And then undergraduate students will register for classes with your academic advisor. Can I jump in for a second, Erin? And um, as you were talking, um, I realized that um, that I didn't mention for graduate student registration. Often graduate students um, register uh, uh, in the, um, during the first couple of days that they arrive. It, it's a little bit different. Um, or you, you might go and talk to your advisor um, during a break at, at the international orientation and find out which classes you should, uh, you should enroll in. At the graduate level, it's, there's not, as I think, as much of a, um, a rush in some ways because uh, the, the classes are basically, I think, always they're smaller. And so there's, there's really literally no chance that um, you wouldn't be able to get the classes that you need. So just wanted to, to put that in there to reassure grad students that you'll be able to enroll and register for class as well. Thanks. No problem. And then uh, just another note on that for um, international undergraduate students or those of you who are newly um, coming to NBC or other institutions for a bachelor's degree program. For first year students um, inside the United States, you take a series of general education or um, core curriculum classes that all students take for graduation regardless of your program. So whether you're in humanities or engineering or health professions, you all take a, a, a certain set of classes. And many of those classes are prerequisite courses, which means they're required before you can enroll in um, additional classes required for your program. And so those are typically what first year students take during the first semester. And so there's many different sections of those classes, or they're offered multiple times each week so that um, many students can, can get into those classes. And so um, that's not a concern. For transfer students that are, are enrolling full-time academic courses their first semester, um, they are provided some more assistance for registration prior to arrival um, as there's transfer support services for registration um, virtually. Um, and then finally, before you arrive, it's important to prepare your uh, immunization paperwork and arrival lodging. So the latter is if you are arriving prior to um, prior to the day before orientation. So for example, if you're arriving uh, within that 30-day window before the program start date on your immigration document, um, on-campus housing will not be available for you. Um, and there's no temporary housing um, on campus necessarily. But there are many um, uh, low-cost hotels that are very good that are surrounding campus um, that either have free shuttles to campus or um, to and from the airport or they're just um, a five minute um, cab ride, taxi ride if necessary. But um, uh, on campus housing, whether you're a first year student, transfer student, or a graduate student, um, opens at NDSU the day before orientation. So that would be the Wednesday um, before the start of classes. You're eligible to check in early. And I would say for graduate students, um, if you did um, get uh, let's say an apartment in University Village, which is one of the, um, the apartment style complexes that we have. In that case, um, you could conceivably move in early, particularly if you, you would probably be um, maybe taking a room that a departing graduate student had, um, had left in an apartment. So it is possible, but for the most part, you would need to stay in a hotel too. Right, so residence halls, um, you cannot check in early, but apartments you can because they're on a different uh, contract. And then just finally, quick notes here to keep us moving. After you arrive, um, there will be the international student orientation. 
um, undergraduate students, so bachelor's degree students, as well as master's and PhD graduate students, um, all joined together for the International Student Orientation. And there's sessions throughout those Thursdays and Fridays um, uh, schedule where um, they're separated for immigration, to talk about how to access your NBCU services, utilize the on-campus resources such as the library, um, the help desk on campus for computer um, issues to rent, um, to rent software, to rent equipment, um, to get involved on campus. I know that maybe for graduate students it may be a little bit more difficult than for undergraduates based upon your research schedule or also if you're a teaching assistant um, with that. Um, but uh, international student orientation provides lots of helpful resources and is required for all new, um, new students at NDSU. Um, undergraduates will do the course registration with their academic advisor, as I mentioned. And then if you're a transfer student at, coming from another post-secondary institution in India or another country, um, there's a special um, welcome lunch and student panel from other transfer students. As we understand that um, you have a different mindset when you're coming to start your program at NDSU because you're continuing on with an academic, um, in a specific academic field or starting another one that you have different um, goals and you're, and you're in a different level of the program. So we uh, have that additional support. And the student panel is other students who transferred to NDSU um, that, again, can provide those resources to you. In the, um, in the time that we have left, I wanted to um, touch on some um, just some, some thoughts and some ideas about um, what you may encounter in the, uh, in the American classroom. And this, I think, holds true. Mo most of what I'm um, discussing is, um, is true both for undergraduate and graduate, although the thrust here, I think, is more for undergrad students. Um, I think at the graduate level, perhaps there, you already have an expectation of, um, of, of what you may encounter. So in the American classroom, perhaps you've heard of, of uh, the, the, the teacher-centered versus learner-centered approaches. In, um, in, in a teacher-centered approach, uh, the learning that happens in the classroom tends to all come from one person, and that is the teacher, typically in the front of the room, giving students knowledge, and the students are absorbing the knowledge. In a learner-centered um, uh, classroom, it's much more cooperative and participatory and interactive, and there's an expectation that um, students are going to be the center, um, which is why it's called learner-centered, but the center and the focus of the, um, the class and the learning. And, and this is the type of uh, classroom culture that you are going to find for the most part, here at NDSU and really at any university or college in the United States. Students are encouraged to ask questions, um, even really expected to, and also to think critically about information um, that's being presented. Uh, obviously, each classroom is different, and you may have a, a professor who is more um, uh, more of a, perhaps I'll say a traditional teacher, um, but most teachers these days in the United States require active participation and independent thinking. Um, and I think that, um, that it's important for you to know that um, you're expected to be, um, to be active in, in class and, and also even to respectfully disagree and to present your opinions. This, often in the United States, part of your final grade is um, is based on participation. Um, if you see that as a, a percentage of your final grade, that's what that's about. There's an expectation that you are going to prepare material and then come in ready to listen, to reflect, to present your own ideas, and to argue um, respectfully with your fellow students and with your teacher in order to, um, to discuss your ideas. And the idea in a learner um, centered, a learner-centered classroom is that you are going to be able to actually to apply the, um, the, the knowledge that you're learning and to learn to think, um, to learn to think critically. 
There are many different ways that you will receive teaching um, or participate in learning in classes in the United States. And uh, they're listed on the board. Lecture is one that you've probably, um, you're probably very familiar with. But be prepared to um, be put in small groups. That's something that the uh, that uh, teachers in the United States uh, are very, uh, I think, uh, open and um, and supportive of doing. Where they may give you a question and um, put you in a group of three to five students, and you sit and discuss, and the teacher moves around listening to you and asking you questions, and then someone may need to stand up from the group and give a, a brief summary of what was discussed. That um, that's something that uh, that happens all the time, undergraduate and graduate level classes. You um, you also are expected to. Um, to come to class knowing the content already. You may have questions about it, but you need to, to do the reading prior to class, um, maybe even take notes. Something that I've done all of my life as a student, undergrad and graduate, is as I'm reading the material, um, writing questions to myself um, that, um, that I can then look at when I'm in class. And if the teacher doesn't answer them, I can use those questions that I've written as uh, you know, part of my participation. It shows the teacher that I have done my homework, um, that I'm interested in the content, and even more than that, it's a chance for me to learn. As I mentioned before, you really need to practice expressing your own thoughts and opinions, and don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, even in the United States, I mean, I think Erin's nodding her head in agreement here. We've grown up with this kind of a learner-centered approach. We know that um, participation is valued, and yet it can be really difficult to ask a question about something that I don't know the answer to. And um, just know that if you have a question that it, maybe you don't understand something, probably um, at least five or ten other people in the class have the same question. And so I've always been grateful when other students ask questions. There's, there's really never a, uh, a bad question or a dumb question. And then I'll just jump in here for a second and also mention that um, inside the United States is part of um, the professor and faculty member engaging or measuring your uh, understanding of the material or also that you came prepared to class um, because the reading that you have assigned for class won't be done in class. They won't be there won't be time given to you to do any of the reading or catch up. The full class period is to discuss and analyze that information or um, use that as a background to discuss another topic. Um, faculty members, um, some more than others, choose to call on um, students to answer questions um, that they're asking, even if you don't know the answer or you do not wish to raise your hand to volunteer. Um, they'll, they will call on you. Um, not to um, make you embarrassed or to um, let others know that maybe you don't know the answer, but just to ensure that you're engaged in the class and, um, and uh, being present in the class as well. So um, that's why sometimes writing notes, even if you don't have any specific questions, those can be used to allude that you've done the reading and to move the discussion forward. That's a really good point, Erin. Um, you, you really need to, um, to come to each class with um, having done as much you know, reading and preparation as possible and as, as you've been required, because the expectation is that, that you're coming prepared. Um, so that the, the teacher isn't teaching you the, um, the content, but you're using what you've read as a jumping off point or a starting point. In, the, um, in, the, in American classrooms, um, you do receive a, a final grade um, for every course that you take, A, B, C, D, F. And, um, and the teachers evaluate students based on um, uh, many different uh, uh, sort of items that are produced during the, the semester. You will get tests at the graduate level, probably not so much. It's a lot more about projects, papers, and presentations. At the undergraduate level, um, almost I would say every class has, um, has tests. You're going to receive a syllabus, which is an outline of the entire course. 
for every class or course that you're enrolled in. So you spend the very first period of the semester going through that syllabus um, really line by line with the teacher explaining to you what you're going to be studying, what the goals of the course are, what um, books or articles or um, other items you may need to purchase for the class, and then a schedule of what you need to prepare for each, each day, when you will have quizzes and tests and assignments due. So it's very clear cut, and that's a great thing to, to um, come, come back, go back to your room the first day of, um, of class and sit down and really start planning out your whole semester, putting it into a calendar perhaps of what you need to prepare when so that you're on time. You get graded on many different things in, in the US classroom, and so you really need to be your own project manager. You will, you will receive many different types of tests, multiple choice, essays, short answers. Even someone who's very comfortable taking, for example, a multiple choice test is going to be nervous the first test or two that they get from a new teacher because every teacher does their testing just slightly differently. So um, be, you know, just, just be aware of that, that you'll probably do better on tests as the semester progresses. And then your, your course grade is um, compiled from homework assignments, from tests that you've done, sometimes from attendance, not so much in graduate courses, but in many undergraduate courses, attendance is, um, is part of your grade. Many courses, though, it isn't. There's an expectation that you are, um, you're now young adults, and um, it's your responsibility to go to class. If I could give you um, one huge tip, it would be always go to class. Even if you don't feel extremely well prepared, it's better to go to class than not to go. So um, uh, that, that I think that's very critical. In terms of um, getting a grade, in the US, students basically also give a grade to their teachers. We, um, you will receive by email a, an anonymous evaluation form that asks you to um, evaluate your teachers. And there'll be a, a series of questions that you can answer on a, on a scale. Um, and then there's room also for you to provide comments. So that, that's important, too. And, and that, that evaluation um, goes into discussion about um, the, 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 the teacher's uh, employment, um, record. Yeah, employment record, basically. And then finally, um, just some tips. And I've covered some of these already. As I said, go to class. And sit as close as you can to the front. Um, or a lot of teachers may put you in a circle. But you know, sit somewhere where you can make eye contact with the teacher and, um, and really be able to listen to them and let them know that you're paying attention. Read the syllabus. That's the outline of the course very carefully. Um, I review my syllabus um, repeatedly during the course of a semester to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Um, I've already talked about reading and taking notes and preparing questions. Introduce yourself to your professor um, and visit them. Professors all have posted office hours, and that means that, um, that you know that if you go to their office during those times, they will be in there with um, the, the goal of uh, being available to meet with students and to talk to them. If you're having a question, maybe you didn't get to answer a question that you'd written in class. Go see your professor um, during office hours and, um, and, and talk to them. It's, it's, um, it's a win, 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 win in that you're going to be able to get special tutoring in a way if you've got things that you don't understand. And you will develop a relationship with your teacher, which is going to enhance your classroom experience and probably enhance your final grade, because you'll be that much more connected. Finally, take advantage of resources. And I think particularly, um, for, well, for all students, but especially for students for whom English isn't your native language. There are, um, we have a graduate writing center, which is amazing. You can come to the writing center multiple times a week and get help working on papers and writing assignments. And there are writing tutors and um, content tutors available for undergrad students as well. All of that is free. It's part of what's available to you as a student on our campus. I'll stop there. 
Um, another couple resources that are um, free for students and not necessarily just for students who are struggling or have questions, but just want to have someone else double check or support um, their thought process would be um, the ACE Tutoring Center. Um, and the ACE Tutoring is typically for undergraduate students. And often graduate students are the ones who, who work there or who assist undergrad students who come in with questions. Um, there are tutors specific for the Joe's general education, those core curriculum subjects that are required for um, all students completing a bachelor's degree in DSU. So for example, there's a specific tutor for science classes, one for math classes, things like that. And those will be individuals who have taken those specific classes or who are graduate students in those specific subject areas or that field of study. Um, they can give you tips about um, ways to study for those specific areas, especially if you're going um, into a humanities or an area that is not directly tied to a science or math class, um, for example. Um, they can also maybe give you some uh, suggestions or um, they may actually be in your class as teaching assistants to the professors or the faculty. Um, and they could provide additional resources such as, for example, this, this professor uses a lot of um, uh, the test content is from the PowerPoint presentations or this faculty member um, heavily relies on the reading. Those kind of tips to help you succeed in the class as each class um, is different as Lisa mentioned. And that's all the content specific um, information that we had today. If there's any questions, we would be open to taking those now. Thank you so much, Erin, um, uh, Lisa, and Tanushka for the great presentation. Um, audience, um, since we have uh, run out of time, um, we would be happy to take a few questions if you have any. Otherwise, you can also email us your queries um, on info at the rate usief.org.in. And um, I'll just put this email address on the screen. So please feel free to email your queries here. Also, I would request Erin and Lisa um, to uh, maybe uh, give uh, an email ID if uh, they're willing to do so, so that students can contact uh, them with their queries. Or, of course, students can feel free to um, uh, get in touch with us with any such queries. So we can see Erin's uh, email ID on the screen. Students, please feel free to write to Erin or to Lisa. Here we have Lisa's email ID. Or, of course, you can write in to us on, um, at uh, info at the rate usief.org.in. Thank you so much, everyone, for logging in for the session. Please tune in next Friday, too, for the webinar on shortlisting and finding the best fit uh, universities. And um, also, um, you know, again, uh, everyone who has logged in, I would request you to email us your queries since we have run out of time for today's webinar. Uh, thank you so much for being such an attentive audience. and. Um, so yes, so the next Friday's webinar is on shortlisting and finding the best fit universities for yourself. So next Friday, same time at 4 p.m. Thank you so much. Thank you.